Okay, uh, I don't know, I'm not real happy with my heat. And this will be the second recording I'm going to try to make on this little deal right here. Uh, Y'all just listen to this story, and it's actually really, I remember when this happened. Yeah, and you're going to have to think about uh, the left wing and the right wing and all this stuff. And if you'll actually do a little research and go back into the news and read the news reports and all that kind of stuff back in the 70s, 80s, actually much further back than that, really. Just just start around there, and uh, you'll see that they were actually having armored warfare almost with the people, pretty much, and the people fighting back. And people find about using crude methods like uh, <laughs> homemade scud missiles is what they did. It's a van that had like a big 55-gallon drum in it, and they'd launch something out of it toward uh, the police, which was actually military and all that kind of, just the <laughs> against the system. The system took over and crushed them and took everything from them. And actually, I believe Australia is that way too now. They took all the arms away from everybody, used every little excuse there was, but what they didn't want to say is, hey, we've been fighting your ass for, I don't know, ever since the beginning of the time since we was in control of you, and uh, right now we're just not going to let you do anything else anymore, is what, pretty well, and they did that. You know, if you got a gun, you're going to jail. It'll happen here if people don't wake up. Huh? Y'all better wake up. But listen, this this is really cool. And, and during the process, I'm going to show you the finds and some of my things. Or actually, it's not the finds. It's the find. And that will be what Angela found. And I'll, I'll show those to you. And then what I've collected over the last few years of traveling. Cool. Y'all enjoy it. Oh, by the way, I was told I could share this. By the I time. want to read something to you guys. Um, Very this is not a visual so you uh, video, your guys. Phone. I got the sig out here for you to look at if you want to. But uh, in all earnest, guys, sit back and close your eyes and listen it's to the sweet. story. It's sent to me by a friend of mine. And the parallels in this story with this what is, is going on in the thought. United States right now is just downright scary. Just downright scary. It's happening right before our eyes. So... Um, Give me about five or six minutes, guys, and uh, and listen up and, and let me know what you guys think. The title of this story is called Just a Shotgun. You're sound asleep when you hear a thump outside your bedroom door. Half awake and nearly paralyzed with fear, you hear muffled whispers. At least two people have broken into your house and are moving your way. With your heart pumping, you reach down beside your bed and pick up your shotgun. You rack a shell into the chamber and then inch toward the door and open it. In the darkness, you can make out two shadows. One holds something that looks like a crowbar. When the intruder brandishes it as if to strike, you raise a shotgun and fire. The blast knocks both thugs to the floor. One wreathes and screams in pain while the other man crawls to the front door and lurches outside. As you pick up the telephone to call the police, you already know that you're in trouble. You see, in your country, most guns were outlawed years before and the few that are privately owned are so stringently regulated as to make them useless. Yours was never registered. Police arrive and inform you that the second murderer has died. They arrest you for first degree murder and illegal possession of a firearm. When you talk to your attorney, he tells you, don't worry, authorities will probably plead the case down to manslaughter. What kind of sentence will I get, you ask? Only 10 to 12 years, he replies, as if that's nothing. Behave yourself and you should be out in about seven. Well, the next day, the shooting in the lead story of the newspaper somehow has portrayed you as an eccentric vigilante while the two men that you shot are represented as mere choir boys. Their friends and relatives can't seem to find an unkind word to say about them. However, buried deep down in the article, the authorities do acknowledge that both victims have been arrested numerous times. But the next day's headline says it all. The lovable rogue son didn't deserve to die. The thieves have somehow been transformed from career criminals into Robin Hood type pranksters. As the days wear on, the story takes wings. National media picks it up and then the international media. The surviving murderer has become somewhat of a folk hero and your attorney says that he is preparing to sue you and will probably win. The media publicly reports that your home has been burglarized several times in the past and that you have been critical of local police for their lack of effort in apprehending the suspects. After the last break-in, you had told your neighbor that you would be prepared next time. 
The district attorney wasted no time in using this to allege that you were lying in wait for the burglars. A few months later, you go to trial. The charges have not been reduced as your lawyer had so confidently predicted. When you take the stand, your anger at the injustice of it all works against you. Prosecutors paint a picture of you as a mean, vengeful man. It doesn't take long for the jury to convict you of all charges. The judge sentences you to life in prison. This case really did happen. On August 22nd of 1999, Tony Martin of Edmonton, North Fork, England, killed one burglar and wounded a second. In April 2000, he was convicted and is now serving a life term. So how did it become a crime to defend one's own life in the once great British Empire? Well, simple. It all started with the Pistols Act of 1903. This seemingly reasonable law forbade selling pistols to minors and felons and established that handgun sales were to be made only to those who had a license. The Firearms Act of 1920 expanded licensing to include not only handguns, but all firearms except shotguns. However, later laws passed in 1953 and 1967 outlawed the carrying of any weapon by private citizens and mandated the registration of all shotguns. Does that sound familiar, folks? Isn't that what Feinstein's want to do? Require registration of all guns? Sound familiar? Continuing, momentum for total handgun confiscation began in earnest after the hunger for mass shootings in 1987. Michael Ryan, a mentally disturbed man with a Glasnoff rifle, walked down the streets shooting everyone he saw. When the smoke cleared, 17 people were dead. The British public, already completely desynthesized by 80 years of gun control, demanded even tougher restrictions. The seizure of all privately owned handguns was the objective even though Ryan used a rifle. Again, familiar sounding? Wasn't it Doomberg that uh, proposed con confiscating weapons? Nine years later, at Dublaine, Scotland, Thomas Hamilton used a semi-automatic weapon to murder 16 children and a teacher at a public school. For many years, the media had portrayed all gun owners as mentally unstable or worse criminals. Now the press had a real crook in which to beat up on all law-abiding gun owners. Day after day, week after week, the media gave up all pretense of objectivity and demanded a total ban on all handguns. The De Blaine Inquiry a few months later sealed the fate of the few sidearms still owned by private citizens. During the years in which the British government incrementally took away most gun rights, the notion that a citizen had a right to armed self-defense became seen as vigilantism. Authorities refused to grant gun licenses to people who were threatened, claiming that self-defense was no longer considered a reason to own a gun. Hmm. Citizens who shot burglars or robbers or rapists were charged while the real criminals were released. We've seen that here too. Indeed, after the Martin shootings, a police spokesman was quoted as saying, we cannot have people take the law into their own hands. All of Martin's neighbors had been robbed numerous times, and several of the elderly were severely injured in beatings by young thugs My who had no fear consequences. Martin himself, a collector of antiques, had seen most of his collection trashed or even stolen by burglars. When the DeBlaine inquiry ended, citizens who owned handguns were given three months to turn them over to local authorities. Being good British subjects, most people obeyed the law. The few who didn't were visited by police and threatened with a 10-year prentice if they did not comply. Police later bragged that they had taken nearly 200,000 handguns from private citizens. Now, how did authorities know who had handguns? The guns had been registered and licensed. Isn't that being proposed by Feinstein right now? America, it is time to wake up. This is exactly why our founding fathers put the Second Amendment in our Constitution. Samuel Adams was quoted as saying, it does not require a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen to set brush fires in people's minds. Folks, this is an important issue. This is not gonna go away. It is up to us to stop this cold. And just one thing more, remember, the reason the Japanese did not invade the United States is because they knew that most of the citizens were armed. And I don't give a damn what anybody tells you. That's the reason everybody After knows. Pearl Harbor, the, the United States British military were. was in no position to stop them. There was nothing keeping them from coming ashore in California except us. That's all I got, folks. Share it around if you want. Later. There you go. I got the permission to be able to share it with y'all. So. And there it is. It's verbal on the end of it. His story. Pretty cool, huh? And that's all real good stuff.
y'all need to pay attention. I ain't too worried about it since I only got one life to live. And that's pretty much it, you know. It's, uh, I don't reproduce. So all you people out there that's got kids and their kids and then you plan on having like future more kids, uh, if somebody carry your name into the future, you need to think about what these people are telling you. There you go. <laughs> hey, peace, y'all. Uh, enjoy. And these are my finds. These are not my finds, but these are Angela's right here. These are these are mine right here. Uh, they got a little value to them. I don't know what they are. She's looked them up. We even went down and spent money and got a book, you know. And uh, the, what promoted that was these quarters and everything found right here, you know. So. These were stacked, just like this, laying on the ground in perfect stacks, side by side. So that tells me there was some more out there, and apparently I drug it all over the place, and I need to go back, you know. <laughs> and that's why I was getting kind of like a little upset with her, you know, go back over there, please. <laughs> so I know there's something else out there. You just, I just don't believe that them two rolls would be the only thing laying in that hole. Uh, and I got a lot of, I'm gonna build a sieve is what I'm gonna do so I can sieve everything out of it because there's a bunch of junk in there. And it's like somebody piled stuff and then left, you know, forgot or something, you know. <laughs> and it growed up, everything here was growed up around everything so I run over it after I got to where I could get the big tractor going with the bush hog, you know. And, uh, well, I try not to run over big stuff like that so I don't tear up the blade. You know, when you sharpen that thing, try to keep it sharp. But there it is. And guess what, folks? It's all this whole video is just food for thought. You enjoy it.